Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. When it comes to predicting wildfire seasons across the public lands landscape, it seems that it's getting harder and harder to base your predictions on past fire behavior. This is Kurt Repencheck, your host at the National Parks Traveler. Last year, there were wildfires in Great Smoky Mountains National Park in March, in Big Bend National Park in April, near Bandelier National Monument and Valles Caldera National Preserve in May, and in Isle Royal National Park in August. Of course, there also were fires in Yosemite National Park, while in Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks, crews continued to work on restoring areas that burned in 2021 during the devastating KNP fire that charred more than 88,000 acres in those parks and surrounding national forest lands. Last year, when we talked with Jim Wallman, a meteorologist in the National Interagency Fire Center in Boise, Idaho, he said fire managers don't know what the new normal in wildfire seasons and behavior is because everything is still changing. Already, we've seen fire restrictions come to some parks, such as Sequoia and Kings Canyon, where just last week fire restrictions took effect to prohibit campfires and charcoal fires in the hot, dry, low elevation areas of the parks. We'll be back in a minute with Jim to see what this year's fire season might look like across the national park system. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to raise private support to deepen everyone's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. The Yosemite Conservancy helps visitors connect with Yosemite through adventures, volunteering, and the arts. It's the only nonprofit dedicated to supporting Yosemite National Park and funds grants to improve trails, restore habitat, protect wildlife, and inspire the next generation of nature lovers. Learn more at yosemite.org. Full of stunning photography and thought-provoking reads, Smokey's Life is a biannual magazine produced by Great Smoky Mountains Association. Members receive it free of charge each spring and fall, and it is available for purchase in retail stores throughout Great Smoky Mountains National Park and online at smokiesinformation.org. The Everglades Foundation, the only organization whose sole mission is to restore and protect America's Everglades. Learn more at evergladesfoundation.org. Welcome back to The Traveler, Jim. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Kurt. During our reporting on the aftermath of the 2020 fire season, which included the Castle Fire that destroyed nearly 10% of the country's giant sequoia groves, we noted that wildfires have spiked since 2015, culminating in the 2020 fire season in Inferno. Christian Shive a forest and fire ecologist with the National Park Service, told us that in a little over a century, from 1910 through 2014, wildfires burned 25% of the giant sequoia range. Then, in 2015 through 2020, wildfires burned 65% of that range. 2020 alone accounted for half of that, 16,000 acres of sequoia groves, dwarfing the 1910 to 2014 combined acreage burned. Beyond Sequoia and Kings Canyon, we also saw massive wildfires in Mojave National Preserve in 2020 and a fire at Point Reyes National Seashore, a place most people probably don't connect with wildfires. Was the 2020 season an anomaly, Jim? Uh, The 2020 season was a bit of an anomaly compared to what we've seen uh, the last several years. But one thing that kind of concerns us is we've seen fire seasons escalate. Um, especially over the past 20 years. And that is, you know, are we going to see more seasons like 2020 in the next 10 to 20 years? Um, That's something we don't know yet, but it potentially is on the the horizon. Now, of course, 2020 was followed up in 2021 by that huge KNP complex in Sequoia and Kings Canyon and fires earlier that year in both Big Bend and Theodore Roosevelt National Parks. And of course, we had the Washburn fire last summer that uh, threatened the Mariposa Grove in Yosemite National Park. 
But we also saw early season fires in Great Smoky, Bandelier, Valles Caldera, Big Bend, and midsummer blazes at Isle Royale, as I mentioned in the introduction. So I guess the fire season's also stretching out a bit, isn't it? The fire seasons uh, are stretching out a bit. There is research being done that they seem to be starting a couple weeks earlier and, and potentially going later, like we saw in 2020. That season went exceptionally long, uh, well into November. And, you know, looking ahead, you know, we're seeing incredibly hot weather in the southwest. Um, we've seen a, a fire in Big Cypress National Preserve in Florida, which isn't that unusual because springtime is fire season in, in southern Florida. A- any guesstimates on, on what we're looking at this year? I mean, here in uh, the Inner Mountain West, um, Utah and Wyoming and uh, Idaho, possibly Montana, I'm not really sure. We've seen a cool, um, moist springtime going into summer. Yeah, I mean, at least for this spring um, and into the early summer, we are expecting a slower than normal start to the fire season, which has really been occurring in the Southwest. Typically, they are well into their fire season. Their their peak fire season is end of June, and they are just starting to get really starting to get going down the Southwest. Now, uh, up in the Northwest, that's an area that's a little bit different, uh, especially in Oregon, Washington, west of the Cascades. You know, you talk about North Cascades National Park, Olympic National Park. They are exceptionally dry for late June. They have had very little precipitation since the beginning of May, and it's been above normal temperatures as well. And there, while there was a fire on Olympic Peninsula right outside the park a couple of days ago, of about 100 acres. So that just shows you how far ahead of normal we are for you know the the heat the dryness and the fire season uh there west of the cascades yeah i was looking at some some uh maps of el nino effects um a little earlier today and uh it did point out that uh i guess el nino is making the pacific northwest a little bit drier it's, it's preventing the moisture from getting into there it is i mean and el nino has like different functions really between uh winter and summer so in this time of year in the summer, what ends up happening is while the Pacific Northwest can be a little bit warmer and drier, especially west of the Cascades over the summer, once you get to about, you know, the northern Rockies, especially near and east of the divide, uh, Montana into Wyoming and into the plains, that's where we start to see what are the normal conditions typically over the summer. Contrasting that, when you go to the southwest, uh, we typically see a weaker than normal monsoon. So normally, like I said, fire activity in the southwest peaks late June early July, and then decreases over the summer due to the monsoon and all the showers and thunderstorms they normally receive. With a drier than normal monsoon, which we're forecasting this summer, and it already looks uh, late to arrive right now, that the fire season in the Southwest, not only is it being delayed, but also could last longer into the summer, if not all summer, if it's a very weak monsoon. Yeah, I mean, we don't seem to hear too much about fires in the national park system in the in the southwest. Although I guess, you know, we had a couple in in Saguaro, I think, last year, and um, of course there was that one that overran Sunset Volcano um, National Monument. Yes, and in the southwest, I mean, depending on where the fire starts are, you know, whether it affects Grand Canyon, the North Rim, uh, like you mentioned, Bandelier, um, and uh, that's something that depends on where the starts are, but you know, this, this year, um, we are really concerned about the Southwest, especially, um, as we go into season because of the weaker than normal monsoon. And because of last year's monsoon, there's a, an exceptional amount of grass growth, fine field growth in the lower to mid elevations that would affect Saguaro national park, for example. So if we did get some starts that that could be affected as we head into summer. Yeah. And also, um, does this spring, play a role in? I mean, you're, you you said there's an expectation for a less than normal monsoon, but we've had a lot of moisture um, April, May, even the first half of June. I mean, um, that could spur a lot of additional vegetative growth that all of a sudden, if you turn off that water, is going to turn into kindling. Right. And that's, a, that's really what we're seeing over the Great Basin. Um, much of the Great Basin right now um, into the Central Rockies was exceptionally wet. Uh, through the spring, you know, winter and spring. So we have a lot of that fine field growth. And the good news is uh, it's delayed the fire season there as well. And so if you're going down to like Zion National Park in southern Utah, it's been really 
you know, a delayed start to the season, their just their grasses are just finally curing out down there. And so their fire season has also been pushed back. But like the Southwest, they're more tied to monsoon. And so instead of like quieting down typically toward late July, like they normally do, they could continue actively through the summer. But as we go to California, and like you mentioned, Yosemite, um, at least in the middle and higher elevations, there's so much snow still left from this winter. Um, a lot of that is still taking time to come off. And so that's going to do, at least in the, in the timbered areas up high, it's going to delay the season and really have like a, a, a greatly reduced fire season. But once you get down to the lower elevations, like you mentioned earlier, we have a lot of those fine field growth and it will dry out this summer. And so that's an area that's probably the biggest concern in those, those middle elevations of the parks, maybe from like two to 5,000 feet. Wow. Now, as I, as I mentioned, um, there was a fire last summer in Isle Royal National Park. That is kind of unusual, isn't it? It is a little bit unusual, but that is in the boreal forest, the southern extent of the boreal forest that goes from you know, northern Minnesota into the UP of Michigan and the uh, you know, lower peninsula of Michigan as well. And so Isle Royale, even though it's in the middle of Lake Superior, is you know, similar fuel type. And they did get a fire. And if it's dry enough, typically they can get you know, some fires there. Uh, the year before in northeast Minnesota, kind of in the boundary waters, they had uh, just outside the boundary waters actually had 26,000 acre fire in 2021. So there is a fire history there. And while we don't think of it's normal, it does happen every few years. And so that's, but it just, you don't think about an Iowa Royale because it's out in the middle of the lake, but the fuel type is similar. So if they're drier than normal, you get a lightning strike, you can get a fire. Yeah, um, I was doing some research, and the the last um, fire that I <clears throat> recall hearing about in Isle Royal was back, oh, in the late 30s, early 40s, when the CCC was there. And you actually had, uh, I think, uh, um, fortunate to have all those CCC Civilian Conservation Corps crew there to help put out the fire. Yeah. Although I think, you know, a lot of these cases, um, those fuels when they dry out, because it's a lot of really deep organic fuels, they can last a long time, especially if they get started later in summer. Now, last a long time. It was just a year or two ago when uh, there was a fire, I believe, in Sequoia that um, um, uh, a tree, I, can't, I don't recall if it was a Sequoia uh, or just a, another conifer, burned through the winter. That, yeah, there's been times where you've heard about that. I know when I uh, was living close to the Sierra. You, you did hear about that a, a couple of times. Um, I know just north of Yosemite, I think it was back in the mid 2000s, one of the fires burned, you know, through the roots all winter. And then you could see smokes the following spring. So it's not unusual. It tends to happen more in those boreal forests, you know, especially in Canada. Uh, not here as much in the United States, but it does happen occasionally. Now, of course, there also was a, a fire not too many years ago in Rocky Mountain National Park that um, I think it wasn't officially declared out until December. Yes. I think that, that, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, that seems pretty unusual. I mean, we usually see snow in September. <laughs> well, you know, that fire um, was really unusual um, in a couple of respects because it didn't start in Rocky Mountain National Park. It started in mid-October west of the continental divide then crossed the divide into the park was that the east you know, troublesome fire that was the east troublesome fire and so yes yeah, so it crossed the divide and stayed active um into the park and not declared out like you said until december the ironic thing about that too is they had about a foot or two of snow in that area at the beginning of september but because it was a really dry summer it got really warm and dry again they didn't get any precipitation after that you know, until these troublesome fires started six weeks later. And then, you know, there you are. You have another really active fire, strong winds on it, and, you know, across the divide. Yeah, yeah. We're talking today with Jim Wallman, a meteorologist in the National Interagency Fire Center in Boise, Idaho, um, about the 2023 summer fire season. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. Listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. 
If you enjoy the Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. Whether it be strategy, business planning, change management, board development, executive search, or diversity planning, Patero Group is here to help. They mix a depth of experience in the parks and land space with the breadth of best practices from other industries. For more information or to schedule a preliminary conversation, go to potrerogroup.com. P-O-T-R-E-R-O group.com. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. You can show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. Do you work or volunteer for the National Park Service? Are you retired from the Department of the Interior? Learn how you could earn $250 by joining Interior Federal Credit Union and opening up a new credit card. Visit their website for membership details and how to join. Federally insured by NCUA. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It is also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people, inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference too at friendsofacadia.org. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the national park system for decades to come. See their successes at gtnpf.org. Okay, we're back with Jim Wallman talking about fire season in the national park system and specifically in the West in general. Um, now, you, we were talking about the East Troublesome Fire and how it jumped the Continental Divide roaring into Rocky Mountain National Park from the West. Is that an example of the extreme fire behavior we're starting to see because of climate change? I mean, you don't often hear fires jumping the Continental Divide. Yes, you don't. You don't. That's the first time I can remember hearing about it. And then, uh, in 2021, we had two fires cross the Sierra Crest that have ne- that has never happened before, going from the west side of the crest to the east side. Uh, one of them was the Dixie Fire, and the other, the Caldor Fire, that went into South Lake Tahoe. Yeah, the Dixie Fire was a, a monster. I mean, it uh, went right across Lassen Volcanic National Park from south to north. Yes, it did. Cut. And uh, um, there wasn't any, really anything the firefighters could do except watch it go it seemed yeah when conditions are that dry and there's a wind on it there's really not a whole lot you can do at that point it's really just protection of life at at that point you know and you try to protect you know as much property as you can but you hope people have defensible space because there's really not a whole lot you can do i mean the fires when it's that dry and with those kind of winds that we're seeing at times there that fire is spotting one to two miles ahead of itself Right. Numerous embers. And there's really not a whole lot you can do uh, when conditions are that bad. If, if they line up, it's you just have to back off and be as safe as possible. So I'm curious, um, you know, you've, you've got since 2015, eight years of, of, of data um, on wildfires, wildfire behavior. Can you measure from, from year to year, like looking back at, at 2020 or even 21, 22, and compare it to current conditions in 23 and, and make any predictions? We, we do look at past years and try to find uh, what we call analog years that are similar to what, you know, the way the weather and climate and fuels are playing out. This year really does not compare to any of the last three because the last three years we were in La Nina and El Nino has just emerged. So we're looking at, you know, years that had a decent La Nina the year before and then moved into uh, El Nino fairly quickly like it did this spring. There's not a whole lot of those years to look back at. And so 
And some of those years are all the way back in the 50s. So it's like, how do they apply to the current conditions now when they're so much different? We don't know. The closest we could come to was 2008, 2009. And we're using that kind of delayed fire season. And, you know, not necessarily a really big fire season, but it was still fairly active. And so that's kind of what we're expecting. So at least for now, we're expecting, you know, a fairly active season, just more geared towards uh, late July, August, which is normal um, and going into September. But we're not expecting uh, expecting an exceptionally long uh, fire season into October, November like we saw in 2020. Part of the reason is uh, with El Nino, um, at least in the uh, fall, we do start seeing the rain return to the Pacific Northwest before it starts to turn you know, drier than normal the summer. And most of those storms shift south into California and the Southwest uh, during the winter. Yeah, I'm curious with that, that drying that's been going on in the Northwest, um, any idea what the conditions are on the ground in say Mount Rainier or, or Crater Lake or uh, you know Olympic? North, North Cascades? Yeah, Olympic North Cascades are definitely dry, drier than they normally would be. I mean, they're probably looking at kind of like late July or early August type of dry that they normally see. Now, when you get a bit farther south toward Crater Lake, because they're on the edge of that really heavy precipitation that fell in California, they're, they're not as bad, even though they've been dry, you know, for the last couple months. Uh, they were so much above normal during the winter that there, that has, you know, mitigated the impact at least for now, you know, so we're not expecting an early start to the season there, but up in the Northwest, uh, you know, for especially Washington, Olympic, North Cascades, Mount Rainier, that's where we have, uh, more concerns, uh, as we head into this summer. How quickly can, can things turn around and, and, i Thinking back to, to 88 um, and the Yellowstone fires, you know, I recall I was working in Wyoming for the Associated Press then, and I recall that May into June were pretty wet. And then it was like, I think the first fire in Yellowstone was June 26th of that year. And it was like somebody shut off the spigot. Um, it was just very dry for the rest of the summer. And, of course, we had the, the conflagrations that uh, went down in history. I mean, can things turn around that quickly? They can turn around um, in about, you know, a couple of weeks, a um, couple of weeks to a month easily. For example, you know, you mentioned Big Bend National Park earlier and, you know, they were fairly wet um, during the early spring. And now they're seeing, uh, you know, it's been exceptionally hot for the last week and will go into next week. And we are not expecting really any precipitation there. So you can get like a flash drought condition where everything all the grasses that have grown because of that wet all sudden are really starting to dry out and some of the brush as well. And so that's a concern where you can, in some areas, you can get that really quick, you know, change in the pattern. Uh, similar thing happened in the, uh, you know, Northwest in 2021, there was that heat wave we all heard about up in right. British Columbia, you know, Western Washington, they, you know, record high temperatures, you get a week or two of that even if it's been you know, like really wet beforehand, you can start to quickly dry things out. So maybe, you know, in areas like the Northwest, where if it was really wet, it would take some time to dry out in areas that are a little bit drier climatologically, even if they're like wetter than normal, it's not all that wet. And then if you go really hot and dry, you know, compared to normal, it changes really fast. It seems that most of the fire season is, is west of the Rocky Mountains, um, west of the Continental Divide. And yet we've seen some, very active and extreme, maybe um, bizarre fire behavior in, in eastern Canada and Nova Scotia, where, you know, recently they had fires up there that, you know, burned roughly 90 square miles and forced the evacuation of 16,000 people. Um, we've had a fire in New Jersey, of all places. You don't associate New Jersey with uh, wildfires. A- any thoughts on, on what the eastern half of the country looks like and, and whether the, the conditions in Canada are mirrored in the northeast or, or you know, the northern uh, border there in Minnesota? Well, at least for – it's a little bit different up in Canada, you know, mostly more boreal forest. And they were exceptionally hot during May into June when a lot of those fires started. And then they had a lightning event, which was extremely unusual. Um so that, that's a little bit different. Now, the, the areas that normally are most similar to where those fires are burned in Canada is north, northern Minnesota into the northern Great Lakes, especially northern Wisconsin, northern Michigan. 
that's where you have very similar fuel type. And while it has been warmer and drier than normal there, and we are concerned, at least so far, we have not seen the fire situation there that we see up Canada. It also hasn't been as exceptionally hot compared to normal in the Great Lakes as it was farther north. Now, the fire danger indices are, are still near record setting there, but we haven't had the combination of these hot, dry days with any winds yet. So while we've had a couple large fires and we're seeing a lot more smaller fires than normal, we haven't seen anything. But it's something that is does have us concerned there uh, as we head into summer. Now, the rest of the East Coast is, is a bit different. Maybe northern New England can start, can see some of those fires too, but they have been wet. Um, there compared to just, you know, once you cross the St. Lawrence River in Canada, it starts to dry out very quickly. But south of the St. Lawrence River, it's been wetter than normal. Um, and then New Jersey is, is a, I know we normally don't think of fires there, but it's not unusual to have fires in central New Jersey and those pine barrens. Maybe not the several thousand acre fires, but to get four or 500 acre fires every year or every two or three years is not that unusual because of the mm-hmm. fuel type. The same thing, same goes for eastern North Carolina and the swamps and and down in Florida, like Big Cypress, Everglades, you can get fires there, typically during the spring like we've seen. So, um, but to get the bigger ones that we've seen, we've got a couple of big ones in North Carolina now, that's a little bit unusual, but you, we do see that maybe every 10 years or so, 10 to 15, we can see those bigger fires in eastern North Carolina. Have there been fires there this year? There have been two large fires over 10,000 acres in eastern North Carolina so far this year. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I think one was, one is uh, they're wrapping up now outside of Wilmington. It's about, I think it's over 15,000 acres. And then there was a one that was over 30,000, uh, a bit farther northeast of there. Must be National Forest. I don't don't recall. It any is, it is National Forest. It's not in the parks. <laughs> Now, and I'm backing up a little bit to the um, the northern tier, um, I believe in, in Sleeping Bear, National Lakeshore, and Pictured Rocks. Um, you've got some boreal forests there. I can't recall any wildfires in those parks, at least none that stood out. Yeah, there, there haven't really been anything significant. Uh, we've seen some fires in the area, uh, especially in the forest and on the state land, state protected lands there. But we have, you know, we haven't seen anything yet, but they are drier there so the normal so that is a concern and then going back to the, the east proper supposedly or as some might put it acadia shenandoah great smoky delaware water gap um national recreation area and along the appalachian trail i think we're not really expecting any anything outside the ordinary this summer uh expecting like you know like normal fire potential so you might have a couple small fires there uh maybe but normally during the, the summer, we don't see a really a large amount of fire activity there at all in the east because mm-hmm. normally it's the wettest time of year, especially the Appalachians up into the northeast, Acadia National Park. So it, it's the wettest time of year. And then they, when we get into the fall, um, right before the, you know, the snow starts hitting, you, know, you get leaf drop. That's where we can start seeing a little bit of an increase potentially, if, and especially if we're going to be exceptionally dry like it was in 2016. Uh, when the chimney tops fire burned. So, but it's generally during the fall that they have a better chance typically for seeing larger fires. Yeah. And and the chimney tops to fire, um, that was not a natural ignition. I don't think, but it was still extremely dry for that time. Was, Was it extremely dry for that time of year? or Was it normally dry? It was extremely dry for that time of year. And then they had a really strong and dry wind event which was unusual, um, kind of like a, almost like a, you know, the Chinook wind you get off the Rocky Mountain, you get a downslope wind, really strong wind gusts, 60 to 80 miles an hour. And the humidity was low for that area. It was about 30%. So that resulted in that big run with the chimney tops two fire. Jim, as I was saying in the introduction, you know, we're seeing um, some fire um, restrictions going into place. I know in, in Sequoia and Kings Canyon, um, the lower elevations, um, they're prohibiting campfires and charcoal fires. A- any sense for um, how it is in other parks in the, the western half of the country? Well, like we were mentioning before, Olympic, North Cascades, Mount Rainier, they are drier than normal. That, that's We have concerns there. And potentially, especially on the west side of Glacier, they've been dry. They had, their snowpack came off really early. 
uh, hmm. this year. So the west side of Glacier National Park, you know, up there in the far north toward the Canadian border, that's where we have our greatest concerns. As you go farther south, um, you know, into central parts of the west, um, you know, if, when you talk about like Lassen Park, Crater Lake, uh, you know, Redwood, in, in through the Sierra, Yosemite, Kings Canyon, um, out to like Great Basin and in the Ro uh, Rocky Mountain National Park, we're not expecting, you know, any real significant, you know, fire season. At least in the Sierra, it's going to start slower and it may stay very low, um, at least at the higher elevations of the Sierra and in California. But farther east, we're expecting like our normal significant fire potential. Not to say that we're not going to have any fires, but we're not expecting any more than, than normal. It's somewhere in that normal range where we could have a couple um, at a couple of the parks in mm -hmm. the central and mountain west and then the southwest i think we're a little bit more concerned uh like toward like bandolier possibly on you know around uh grand canyon uh zion because of this drier than normal monsoon that we could have higher than normal fire potential there this summer we're not right now we're not calling for it but it is something that we are aware of and we're just watching to see how this monsoon if it does stay really dry we know at least for the next two weeks, it's going to be really dry with the monsoon. We're not going to see the normal increase that we do see by early July in the Southwest. So that has us concerned. Now, I know perspective is sometimes hard to grasp. And, and when you're looking at an area as big as the West, you know, we heard about the KNP complex that roared through Sequoia and Kings Canyon, the Dixie Fire that roared through uh, loss in volcanic, um, the number of fires that Yosemite has seen in recent years, and people who aren't familiar with it are guessing, well, what, what's left to burn? There's a lot. <laughs> I mean, when you see the size, uh, you know, the West, um, when you live out here for any length of time, there are still a lot of areas that have not been touched. Um, it's, mm -hmm. it's like you can pull up a map for like the last 30 or 40 years. And you can see like, you can see a bunch of areas that have burned, you know, two or three times in that period, if not more, and the areas that are not, are, have not been touched. So, um, and a lot of the, the uh, in, interesting thing about part of the fires in the West is that um, some of these areas are, are historically probably burned more frequently, uh, mm -hmm. you know, every 10 years or so. And so those are like the understory burns. So, you know, you can burn have an area that burns and then 10 years later you can burn again um for example we all remember the campfire from 2018 i know it's not in the national parks but that a lot of that same area had burned either in 2012 or 2008 it was already burned and it burned again and a lot of it has to do is when you get a few years and you have especially a lot of brush grass and brush you start getting the you know the smaller timber in there it's really flammable. And by that time, it's like you have a dense brush field maybe within 10 years that is ready to burn again um, mm. in some parts of the West. So, but it all, it all depends. Like you, it may be not going to see the big timber fires that are not going to come back in like 10 years. It takes a lot longer for the timbered areas, but even those timbered areas can burn again because they're primarily going to be brush and small and uh, saplings that are susceptible when they're young. Yeah. You know, I'm familiar with Yellowstone because, you know, gone there a lot of times i was on the ground in 88 and reporting on the fires and you know you can go back to yellowstone today geez almost 40 years <laughs> after those fires and you can see the areas of regrowth and you know it looks great in many places i don't think we've had any really large fires on the scale of the 88 fires in yellowstone no and you know and also depending on the frequencies depending on your fuel type how ready they are to burn um, you know, Lodgepole, which is a lot of Yosemite or Yellowstone, excuse me, uh, you know, burns differently than Ponderosa and Jeffrey Pine. How uh, so? Um, well, Lodgepole, um, it tends to be a lot denser. And so when you get fires in there, they tend to be stand replacing like what happened in Yellowstone and then they grow up again. And so that's kind of what, you know, Lodgepole does after a certain period of time, they, they're more likely to die. This is in my area expertise. So just... But the, I mean, this is stuff I've picked up over the years, whereas like a lot of the Ponderosa, uh, they tend to be less dense stands. Um, you have a lot of, you know, grass and brush and you're only in a Ponderosa stand, a mature Ponderosa stand. Um, you will get, you know, smaller, you know, fires that are lower intensity that burn the grass and brush, but leave most of the, the bigger trees behind. And so they can burn a little bit more, you know, frequently to burn out 
the underbrush. So it depends on what, you know, fuel type you're in, how quickly it burns. Yeah, interesting, interesting. That's Jim Wallman, a meteorologist in the National Interagency Fire Center in Boise, Idaho, um, trying to give us a little foresight into what we might expect for the summer fire season across the national park system. Jim, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Kurt. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. Next week, we'll be talking bison, or buffalo as some call the national mammal, with Dayton Duncan, who along with Ken Burns, has been working on a documentary about the history of the American buffalo. Until then, this is Kurt Repencheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Park's Travelers podcasts. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. Editing and production work for the National Parks Traveler podcast is done by Splitbeard Productions. You can learn more about us at splitbeardproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.